Um, nice to see you all here. Um, the only announcement we've got to make is that on the Thursday we've got the Church Council meeting. Which we would like to see you all here, please. Um, nothing else to report. When is when is okay? She's just the homeless and visitors. That's this weekend. So that's what time's the meeting, Michael? Is it two? Pardon? Two o'clock. Uh, two o'clock meeting on Thursday. Yes. Hey, Mark, we have a young lady here, Ruth. We haven't seen you for a long time. So no. nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. It's lovely to be back. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We come before God with our opening prayers. We are called to love our enemies, but this is difficult. Let us invite God to direct our thoughts and our prayers. Let us ask God to move in our hearts and minds. Let us ask God to teach and show us what it means to love our enemies. Let us worship him. Father, we thank you that we are loved by you, no matter what. You call us to let your love flow through to other people, including those who may have hurt us. Give us the grace and compassion to do this, and give us understanding as we explore this today. Amen. Our first hymn is Praise to the Holiest in the Height, uh, Sing in the Faith, number 334.
psalm set for today is Psalm 37, verses 1 to 12 and verses 41 to 42. I'll lead with the words in light type and ask you to respond with the words in bold. Do not fret yourself because of evildoers. Do not be jealous of those who do wrong. Put your trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on its riches. Commit your way to the Lord and put your trust in him and he will bring it to pass. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Refrain from anger, leave rage alone. Do not fret yourself, it only leads to evil. In a little while the wicked shall be no more. You shall search out their place, but they will not be there. But the deliverance of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Was in the beginning, is now and ever shall. Amen. We sing again hymn number 466 in Singing the Faith. Have faith in God, my heart. 466. hear our gospel reading which has been set for today from Luke chapter 6. Luke 6, 20 to 38. Looking at his disciples he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoicing in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. 
for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be the measure to you. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O my Lord and God. Amen. If the start of that reading sounded familiar to you, it's probably because you may have heard it last week. This is a continuation of what's known as the Sermon on the Plain. And because today's reading starts with the word but, <laughs> it helps to have a bit of context as to exactly what's gone on before it. And these are familiar words from Jesus in today's Gospel. Love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Phrases that have entered into everyday thought and speech, at least so far as knowing about them goes. Actually practicing them is a whole other thing. This is the seventh Sunday in the season of Epiphany. Epiphany meaning to show forth appearance, manifestation or revelation. Ever since the first Sunday back in January, the readings each week have all tried to reveal something about Jesus or the nature of God or our faith. You might want to think about what is revealed to you in today's readings. This idea of loving one's enemies is known as the golden rule. Many religions have one. Usually it's along the lines of do no harm or something similar. There's a story about a man who went to a famous rabbi, Rabbi Hill, and asked him to tell him the whole of the Torah while standing on one leg. Hillel replied, that which is hateful to you, do not do to others. The rest is commentary. <laughs> it's a brilliant summary and I love that line. The rest is commentary. We know from many other Bible passages that Jesus called upon his followers to love their neighbours. In Luke, that leads into the story of the Good Samaritan following the question, but who is my neighbour? And it's worth remembering that perhaps the term neighbour and enemy are synonyms of each other, that they are interchangeable probably because sometimes our neighbours can be very difficult to get on with, especially politically speaking, and especially if you are a small country like Israel, surrounded by very many unfriendly states. 
then and now. However, Jesus' golden rule is different from everybody else's. It's not just a case of not doing any harm, but of actively doing good. We may not feel that we have actual enemies, but I'm sure there are people we dislike and avoid, sometimes even within our churches. And the principle is the same, that we should act lovingly towards them, being willing to help them, to give to them, and to bless them. This is deeply countercultural. Just how much so was recently brought home in an article in The Atlantic in December 2021, which reported on a speech made by Donald Trump Jr. The title of the article was The Gospel According to Donald Trump Jr. And the byline said, the former president's son told a crowd that the teachings of Jesus have gotten us nothing. And it reported this, I quote, and bear in mind he is a Republican, so the we replies to everyone on the right wing of US politics. Relatively early in the speech, he said, if we get together, they cannot cancel us all, okay? They won't. And this will be contrary to a lot of our beliefs because I'd love to not have to participate in cancel culture. I'd love that it didn't exist. But as long as it does, we'd better be playing the same game, okay? They're playing hardball and cheating, and we've been playing softball. We've turned the other cheek, and I understand, sort of, the biblical reference. I understand the mentality, but it's gotten us nothing. It's gotten us nothing while we've ceded ground in every major institution in our country. End quote. What drew me to that particular article was the fact that it was mentioned on one of the podcasts that I listened to in preparation for today's service. And the comment was that what Donald Trump Jr. said here was absolutely right. If you want to win in terms of coming out on top according to the ways of the world, then don't do this. Don't love your enemies. Don't give without expecting anything in return. What are you, crazy? The article itself commented, the teachings of Jesus have gotten us nothing. It's worse than that, really. The ethic of Jesus has got in the way of successfully prosecuting the culture wars against the left. If the ethic of Jesus encourages sensibilities that might cause people in politics to act a little less brutally, a bit more civilly, with a touch more grace, then it needs to go. And the comment was that uh, Donald Trump Jr. was kind of voicing the subtext that a lot of people actually think. Now, of course, it's the role of politicians to create divisions, to have an us and them, a right and a left, and to paint everything as either black or white, good or evil. And to a right-wing Republican such as Donald Trump, both father and son, they are, of course, on the side of the angels in their own minds. Now, Jesus gives some examples in his sermon, though they don't fit into the category of loving so much as they fit in the category of non-violent resistance. The first one is the familiar one. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, offer to him the left also. The second is that if someone demands your cloak, give them your shirt as well. What the commentators I looked at agreed on was that in the first example, both parties had an element of power and an element of choice, the one striking and the one being struck. Presumably, say, two Jewish men, not a Roman and a Jew, and not a man and a woman, because women at that time did not have agency. Both parties could decide on a path of violence, 
or not, on a path of exploitation or not. This text, turning the other cheek, absolutely does not give abusers the right to abuse and it does not force victims to stay victims. If a child is being beaten, you don't tell them to turn the other cheek. You contact the safeguarding officer. One explanation for offering the other cheek is that it makes it clear that the person striking has to have either a justifiable reason for striking again or to admit that they had no reason to strike in the first place. Whereas if you retaliate, it's just a straightforward fight. Regarding the clothing, someone commented that Jewish men didn't wear many clothes, in terms of layers that is, and if he gave away his cloak, his outer garment, and his shirt, his main garment, then he'd be near enough naked. Now, whether that is love, by being willing to be humiliated in order to help another person, or whether it's another act of non-violent resistance designed to shame the other person and to shock them into a realisation of what they're doing, I'll leave that up to you to decide. Now, one last thought before we break for another hymn. When we read or hear this passage, I think we always assume that we will be the victim, that we will be the one being struck, that we are the ones being called on to turn the other cheek. But what if we're not? What if we are the powerful bully, the one doing the striking? Here's an anecdote that might shock us. In the early 19th century, which is incredibly modern, historically speaking, a group of English Christian missionaries published a version of the Bible called, and I quote, select parts of the Holy Bible for the use of Negro slaves in the British West India Islands. It's called the Negro Slave Bible. And if you Google that term when you get home, you can read about it. Naturally, this so-called Bible cut out all references to freedom and escape from slavery. And you can imagine the impact that would have on a Bible if you cut out Exodus and then everything that relies on that story. In the end, they only included 10% of the Old Testament and only 50% of the new. Because if you want to win in terms that Donald Trump Jr. would understand, then that's the kind of violence you have to inflict on the word of God, tearing the very heart out of the gospel message. What's interesting to me is that copies of this Bible are very rare, not because many weren't printed, but because there was an attempt afterwards to collect and burn them and destroy the evidence. You often hear comments about people from that time and earlier. For example, Edward Colston, after his statue was toppled in Bristol, that it was a different era, that cultural rules were different then, that we can't judge them with the rules we have today. The fact there was an attempt to destroy these Bibles shows that these people fully understood what they were doing and fully understood that it was wrong. Unfortunately, destroying paper Bibles doesn't get rid of the mindset behind it. The Victorians believed not everyone was equal. Even I, as a youngster, sang the infamous verse from All Things Bright and Beautiful. The rich man at his castle the poor man at his gate, God made them high and lowly and ordered their estate. We know something of the abuses of power within the British Empire and the history of racism in the UK. I remember some of the TV shows from the 1970s and 80s, which could never be shown now. And the struggle of ethnic minorities against the inherent, inbuilt white privilege that people who have it 
don't even know it exists, and those who don't very much know that it does. When the Black Lives Matter movement started, there was a backlash from people arguing that all lives matter. Of course they do. Hopefully no one would say otherwise. But for too long, black and brown lives have not mattered. And there are many places in the world where that's still true. And therefore, it's necessary to make up the difference. A bit more on that later in part two. But for now, we'll have a time of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, with sorrow we admit how well we know that our lives have not been holy as you will. We confess the sin we know and regret the shame we feel. We confess that some thoughts have been unworthy, centred on ourselves, denying others. We confess that some of our words have been wounding, barbed and harsh, twisting deep, whether we intended hurt or harm, or just didn't think at all. We confess that some of our actions have been unfitting, kingdom destroying, love denying. We confess that sometimes we have been silent and still in the place of need, hesitant to give and slow to care. Remember, Lord, your tender care and love unfailing, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins and offences of my youth, but remember me in your unfailing love, in accordance with your goodness, Lord. Amen. We join in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We sing again, number 429, in Sing the Faith 429, Lord, we turn to you for mercy.
all of what I said in part one was just a few verses from one of the readings. And of course, we have four set readings every Sunday. But I'm only going to touch very briefly on the Old Testament passage from Genesis chapter 45, which is the story of Joseph. And I'm not going to read it because it's a very long passage in itself. And it also requires a bit of backstory. Joseph was the youngest son of Jacob with 10 older brothers and was his father's favorite. His father gave him the famous coat of many colors. And he also boasted about dreams he had where he was lording it over all his family. In short, he was a bit of a brat. His brothers decided they'd had enough of him and ended up selling him into slavery, telling their father that Joseph was dead. No doubt they thought Joseph would disappear within the vastness of Egypt and they'd never see him again. But of course, events conspired against them. When the Pharaoh of Egypt had a dream about an oncoming famine, Joseph was placed to interpret the dream and to do something about it, so that when the famine hit, Egypt could sell grain to the surrounding countries. Joseph's ten brothers came to buy food and he recognised them. He also found out on their first visit that there was another brother who he'd never seen. He insisted that brother come back with them. All this time they didn't recognise him. And it's in today's passage that there is the big unveiling, the recognition. Perhaps this is the revel this, perhaps this is the epiphany the moments of realization. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? They couldn't answer him. Perhaps they were horrified, or maybe they thought it was some kind of trick. Reading Genesis 45 verses 4 and 5, then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me, and they came closer. He said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Of all the things he could have said, Joseph spoke words of love. Of all the range of emotions and reactions open to him, he chose to be kind and forgiving. True, he had messed around with his brothers on their previous visit to buy food by playing tricks on them, but now he's all on the level. To me, this looks like the model of restorative justice, which has seen some success in recent decades. This is where a victim meets the one who has done them harm by mutual agreement and they have a conversation, hopefully forming a relationship. One striking example is that of Joe Berry, whose father was killed in the Brighton bomb in October 1984. She met up with Patrick McGee, one of the bombers, and together they have gone to events as joint speakers, both speaking for peace and for reconciliation. What an amazing witness to the power of forgiveness. And of course, we might also think about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa after the end of apartheid, where an amnesty was offered to wrongdoings on both sides if they were willing to speak about what they had done. Reconciliation is offered as an act of mercy and of grace. It doesn't mean that there's no consequences. If Patrick McGee hadn't been released under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, he'd still be in jail. But sometimes the victims are willing to overlook the issue of consequences and go to forgiveness, as with Joseph and his brothers. 
The picture that's been on the screen throughout is of Coventry Cathedral, which was bombed in World War II, and which also has a programme of peace and reconciliation. The point about the reading from Luke about loving our enemies and from the Old Testament about forgiving them is that it's not humanly possible. Yet with, all, yet with God, all things are possible. There is an ethic of love which is greater than all of us. We probably make grace and forgiveness and love abstract ideas, warm and fuzzy and comforting. We should love because it's lovely. We should forgive because we love. But actually turning the other cheek could be painful and humiliating and frightening. And perhaps if we are ever in that position, then it's a time to hand control over to God and let the Holy Spirit shine through us so that we can respond in a way that is more in the way of Christ than our usual human response. And maybe that's a kind of epiphany as well. Our next hymn is number 481, 481, The Lord's My Shepherd. Now, you've been staring at a bag of oats and a jar. All the yes, <laughs> I know. The 
thing I had in mind was the verses from Luke 6, which are on the screen. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. I promise the stewards I will try not to make a mess. Who gets to do the vacuuming? Right. Will this fit in there? I guess that's the question. <sighs> no, it's not a treat. <laughs> A few. Now, one comment. I um, I looked at an American recipe, and of course, Americans use cups rather than weight. And the, the thing is, that can be very inaccurate because if you do this, you can get a lot more in the cup, and that will mess your recipe up. There you go. Press the press down, shaking together, and. go and just for good measure because as we heard in the psalm 23 god doesn't know when to stop blessing and so our cup overflows and i will stop there because it's making a bit of a mess but i hope you get the image we are very much loved and very much blessed now as we know ourselves to be blessed, forgiven and loved by God's overwhelming love, we now pray for others that they may also experience this grace. And the response to Lord in your mercy is hear our prayer, let us pray. Jesus, the face of God's compassion Help us to show compassion to those who suffer in body, mind or circumstance, giving what we can to bring relief and comfort, our presence, our skills, our resources. We pray for people who we love and those who love us. And we also pray for people we do not love and who do not love us. We name them before God now in the silence of our hearts. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, the face of God's mercy, help us to confront the conflicts in our world with a desire for justice and the hope of healing for all involved. We pray for a peaceful resolution to the mounting tensions between Ukraine and Russia. May your peace, which surpasses understanding, swoop into the hearts and minds of those with so much power. May we become transparent about why we fight wars and realise that our lifestyle choices are involved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, the face of God's forgiveness, help us to forgive those who have hurt us. Heal the wounds that continue to fester and release us from a desire for revenge and retaliation. 
free us from being hostages to the past and release us from the tethers that bind us to our abusers. Show us where it is possible to do good for those who call us enemy, even if the only good we can do is to part ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, the face of God's judgment, help us to relinquish the desire to condemn those we disagree with, those who differ from us, and those who oppose us. Guide us in making fair and just decisions, discerning your will in all things. Help us to condemn evil without condemning those you yourself came to save. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, the face of God among us, you have called us to live in your kingdom by way of love and service. We pray for those who have died, that they may dwell forever in your kingdom through your promise of mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And there is a, pray, a prayer especially written for the heightening tensions in Ukraine by the President of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Holy God, we hold before you all who live close to war and conflict and all who live close to the threat of war and violence. We remember especially at this time people in Ukraine and Russia. We pray for non-violent and peaceful resolutions of conflict. Give to us all hearts of hospitality and sanctuary. Forgive us all our hostility and hatred. Bring all people to the humanity you give us and to the reconciliation and healing for which you gave your life. Strengthen us all to work with you to build justice and peace, reconciliation and healing in our hearts and our homes, our streets, our communities, our neighbourhoods, our nations. Bless all who live lives for the peace and well-being of others and, we pray, make their service fruitful. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thanks to events in the news in recent years, we've heard of the slave trader Edward Colston, not somebody I think I'd ever heard of before. And a generation after him, there was another slave trader. He was a hard man, foul-mouthed and violent, but he came to see the error of his ways and he repented. He gave up the slave trade and he became a clergyman, forever speaking and preaching against the very wrongs he himself had committed and of which he was very much aware. And he wrote the words of our closing hymn. We'll sing again, number 440, Amazing Grace. 440.
be to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Let us share the grace together, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.